do want to thank our legislators as well because um, I didn't plan on saying this, but since Wade brought up the anti CRT bill, uh, I'll just say that it was we watched actually some of that debate in my class, in my Bible class, and we've been talking about uh, we've been talking about Marxism for a while and, and just what it looks like and how it plays out. And so when we see the superintendent of a very, very large school district say, that's not in our classroom, what are we talking about? And the kids be able to say, yes, it is. It's in this or that. Um, that was just, I, I just thank you guys. Thanks for watching over um, us and, and those who may not even know the danger. That's why it's so dangerous is when you don't know that it poses a danger. So you're, you're going to be taking shots from people that don't even really understand what it means. And so there's another guy that I really like named Jesus that did the same thing. And so uh, you can be emboldened by him. And I think even by Paul today as we look at him. So my name is Jamie Hall. I've been at OBA 14 years. Um, I've been asked to share at this conference because my wife and I have both homeschooled our children and then had them in uh, Christian schools as well. Both public of pro, uh, products of public school. My wife has been a public school teacher. Uh, I think she's taught about seven years um, in Chicago and in Dallas, and then in rural school out here in Fairview before we moved to Enid. Uh, so we, my, my grandfather was a public school headmaster. Superintendents. <laughs> superintendents. Uh, he was farmer superintendent pastor for 47 years in Southwest Oklahoma. So I I love that this is happening. Kayla, thanks for organizing it. Uh, and I can't. I think what Eric said was a great intro. That's that's exactly what um, I believe this should look like. And honestly, what I'm going to talk about is going to be applicable for hopefully everybody because it's coming right out of the scriptures. Uh, it's a pretty big task to say, how do you, how do you talk about this specific uh, portion of how you decide to educate your children? And so I decided to go a little broader and let it apply and let the Holy Spirit help you apply it to whatever context you're educating your kid in or whatever context you teach in, um, whether it's homeschool or uh, public school or in a Christian school. Uh, so my main aim is to show that if we follow God's plan for discipleship of the Great Commission, then the things like morality that we talked about, the church's future and education done well are going to follow. So if we get the foundation right, then these other things will follow um, suit. So I'm not going to talk as much about uh, maybe some of the, what I would call occupational hazards of where we've been as a, in, in a private school, Christian school, uh, versus a home school. That will kind of come out, I think, as we look at what Paul does here. But I'm not going to like specifically speak to it. I'm going the Holy Spirit lead you guys in that. Uh, thank you also to North Carolina for hosting. Guys, I've been here 14 years and I've seen uh, a lot of faithful local churches push back darkness in this uh, arena in, in Enid. And I just thank you guys for being a gospel preaching uh, church in North Oklahoma and partnering there. So I want to look at Acts 17. I believe it provides a beautiful picture for how our children and how we should engage the world. And so it gives us a, a target. And if we look at that and we're saying, no way, that's... We can't, we're, we're missing it, well then maybe we can use some of the resources here on all sides to help us get to that point. Um, we see all over Acts, the early disciples taking this new wonderful message of the gospel to a, a perishing world. But I think Acts 17 fits our conference perfectly because it kind of talks about a battleground. Um, it kind of shows, uh, like the, the flyer said, how to, how to prepare our children for the battleground they're facing. So, with all the pandemic that's happened in the last year, I saw a few uh, different publications bring to light one sermon that I really like by C.S. Lewis. And if you hear him mentioned a few times today, it's because he his impact on the kingdom of God has been unbelievable. And he did it from an educational setting. C.S. Lewis was a professor both at Oxford and Cambridge. So he would have been the smartest guy in the room. I've never been accused of that, nor will I be. But this guy was. And look what he's done. Not just near Christianity and not just the you know, Chronicles of Narnia, but out of what he has um, produced is a lot of great literature on education. And so one thing he did in, well, in 1939, as World War II was getting started, was he was asked by the vicar at St. Mary's in Oxford to preach a sermon because the undergraduates were pretty worried about World War II. And C.S. Lewis had been in World War, the Great War, World War I, and 20 years earlier had been injured 
by Friendly Fire. Uh, you guys might know the story, but uh, a shell exploded, killed two of his colleagues, injured him. He came home, and he was an atheist. You know, the well chronicled conversion story of how he came to Christ is awesome. So this is 20 years after that, and he went through it. So the vicar said, hey, you've been through some hard stuff. Can you come give us a sermon on how to do education in a battle time? So during the pandemic the last year, a lot of people have taken that and said, hey, we're going through a hard time. Let's apply what C.S. Lewis taught us. And so he gave a sermon, which is now uh, kind of, it was called None Other Gods, Culture and Wartime, and later it was published into a series of essays called Culture, I'm um, sorry, Learning in Wartime. And I would just say probably the best thing you could do is leave right now and just go read that because I cannot talk. What he's going to say. Just go read that essay. I will not blame you if you do that. Or maybe do it later. Um, so you don't hurt my feelings. But I will not talk that. I'm going to borrow heavily from him. But he literally is talking about what we are doing. And one of the things that really encouraged me. And I think is what is this in the spirit of what you're going to see Paul do in a second. Is that he said we've always been in wartime. There wasn't some easy time. That we're just trying to recapture because no matter where you came from, it was always hard for somebody. It's always been a war. And if we think that it's not and that, and that our goal is just to make it not a war anymore, then we're missing why we're here on earth as Christians. And so he goes into de detail a little bit on that, and I'll talk about that too. But the good old days is really hard to recapture when maybe those good old days weren't really what we thought. Um, we don't want to be misled in, in those ways. So... He says that, which that's a whole other topic that's fascinating, but here's the top, here's the quote that I want to use today. And I'm going to stop a couple times and explain what he means in this context. He says, if all the world were Christian, it might not matter if all the world were uneducated. Not just educated as far as philosophy, morals, um, and religion, but he means also just in the gospel in general. But as it is, a cultural life will exist outside the church. Whether it exists inside or not. So what he's saying is we can try to insulate ourselves, but something's happening out there and it's not going to not happen. So who's going to go engage those people is what he's saying. To be ignorant of that and simple now, he says, not to be able to meet the enemies on their own ground would be to throw down our weapons. And to betray our uneducated brethren who have under God no defense but us against the intellectual attacks of the heathen. He's saying, who's going to tell them if we don't? You, who know the gospel, who've been educated in the gospel, in whatever setting you've been educated, you're here because you're a Christian. And if we don't go out, like Kenneth said in the flyer, I guess you read that, or somebody did, the, the battleground is there. If we don't go, who is going to go? And so he says this great line, good philosophy must exist for no if for no other reason, because bad philosophy needs to be answered. The cool intellect must work not only against the cool intellect on the other side, so if you're a smarty pants, it's not just that you're working against the smarty pants on the other side or out there in the world, but he says also against the muddy heathen mysticism, which denied intellect altogether, saying that some people are like, well, I'll just forget it, eat, drink, and be merry, um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna die anyway. So he's saying that you have to engage on both levels. And he says this, and because of that, the learned life is for some a duty. Meaning that our job is actually, it can be a duty sometimes. I mean, we gotta pull it along and learn. If you heard a little bit of what we just listened to, and we're like, man, that's a little bit scary. That's okay. That's okay because we have the truth. And it might be a duty to learn a little bit and to stretch outside and find some resources to help us engage and equip our kids and ourselves to go do what Paul's about to do in Acts 17. So what does Paul do? Look at Acts 17 verse 16. This is an unbelievable passage, and I hope to explain it more as we go why I think so. But we're going to start in verse 16. When Paul engages... The cultural center of the universe, walking right into Athens. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, he had some friends, um, Paul and Silas, who he got ran out of Thessalonica, and he's just waiting for him. And of course, Paul, he can't just sit still, right? Got to go and do something. Um, so he doesn't lay low. He just walks right into Manhattan, basically. He, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. If you have not... I. If I would have made a PowerPoint, I would have showed you a picture of what they called the marketplace then. Um, the Agora, there was this long stretch, and there was idols literally lining both sides. So he's walking into this, and this is a spectacle, okay? So imagine yourself walking into that. So, what does he do? He reasons in the synagogue with the Jews. He always was the Jews first. 
and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? That was a very pejorative term, I'll explain a little bit later. Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him, and they brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. For as I passed along and observed the object of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, so that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our beings, or quotations. Or even as some of your own poets have said, quote, For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, and now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, Jesus Christ, whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, this is not the point of what I'm about to say, but notice their reaction when the gospel is shared. It's one of three things. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, man, that sounds crazy, right? Some guy died and rose again. Some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But the third option, some men joined him and believed, among whom were also Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. This passage is long. I'm not going to preach it. You don't have to worry. Um, I will move quickly. But I do want to pull out of this passage some, I think, very encouraging and maybe even exhorting things from Paul's engagement here with the Athenians. Uh, and once again, apply this to your context, because it's such a broad context here. Apply this to where you, uh, in your own life, what you believe about education and how to do so uh, with your family. Um, I can't spend a lot of time on the background, but Athens at this time was not the political center of the universe anymore. Uh, but it was probably still the cultural center. One author said, the highest level of culture attained in classical antiquity, even today, the, the sculptures, the library, the oratorical skills of skills, sorry, uh, Oklahoma there, skills of Athens, they've not been surpassed. I had a really awesome professor, he's since passed, but at the University of Oklahoma, Dr. Rufus T. Fears, uh, he would come to eat it sometimes. If you guys ever heard him, oh my gosh, he was amazing. And I was so lucky, I took all of his classes, and then I got really lucky and got to be in a senior capstone class. So there's just 12 of us here with Dr. Fears every day. And he's, we're going through all the founding documents of our nation, how we got what we got from the Greeks and from the Romans and from John Locke and all of everything. It was so awesome. And he used to tell us, I remember him, he would like put marbles in his mouth or little rocks because that's what the Athenians would. He'd say, this is how they would learn how to do oratorical skills. So they were really big on this. They, it didn't matter if it was true or not. It was like, if you speak good, all right, then I can convince you. That was what the Athenians were about. So he walks into this place, which would be very intimidating. And I think if we're on a battleground, we can relate. It'd be very intimidating to walk into the philosophical, cultural center of the universe, wherever that is today. Maybe it's Times Square or whatever. And to speak up against, and this is what Bryce just said this, like most people today, we feel like we're afraid to speak. This should encourage us. We don't have to be afraid to speak because we do have the truth. Athens was the home of Socrates and Plato, like Wade mentioned, uh, the adopted home of Aristotle, Zeno, and Epicurus. And because of their unrivaled past, Rome, who ruled the world at the time, allowed them to kind of stay on as an ally. So it's fair to say that Paul walked into the most culturally significant city maybe ever, and he walks right into all of these idols. So I think that if we're a little worried about how our kids are going to engage the world, we can take encouragement from this. Because what he is walking into is far more worrisome, in my opinion, 
than what we are walking into now. Um, I think we probably would look at the idols to face and navigate in our culture and the spectacle and be able to kind of look and see what we would apply. And, you know, their idol might be this or that. What is our idol to look at, which is a question to ask. Uh, are we running from that battleground or are we actually engaging it? C.S. Lewis said it. Once again, he said a cultural life is going to exist outside the church, whether it exists inside or not. Right? So we can't throw down our weapons. And I, I, right here we see Paul's pastoral heart because he says in 1 Corinthians 1, in a different letter, he says this. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? I like how like he's lived this. He's been at the most center point of all the greatest debaters in the world. He's like, where is that guy? Has God, not God, made foolish the wisdom of the world? So what he says is, I walk into Athens, I've walked all over this world, and what he does is his heart doesn't allow him to not engage. Right? He loves him so much because he says, who's going to get the gospel to them if I don't? He knew that if he left the Athenians to their wisdom, they were headed for hell. And he says, he finishes up this passage in 1 Corinthians 4 says, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. So he said, he knows whatever wisdom they come up with, it will never lead them to the right place unless they get the truth. So it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling blocks to Jews and folly to Gentiles. And well, I'm going to talk about that, but we're going to be seen as folly. We're going to be seen as a stumbling block if we believe in the resurrection and that it changes how we educate everything, every part of our life, which includes education, right? So, again, Paul knows that their wisdom and idolatry could not bring them to a knowledge of God. And he doesn't run. He lets the Great Commission guide them that God has given us. He engages this heathen culture, this big, bad Athenian culture, right? He engages it, but what I want to look at for the rest of the time is how. What did he do? What, what do we see from the text that shows how he engaged it? Because then we can apply those things to how we decide to engage the culture for Christ, okay? Um, if you look at verse 16 again, you can see that it bothered Paul to see the idols. Literally, it says in the Greek, it irked his spirit within him. We can relate. We've already talked about some of those idols that irk us when we see them, right? The idols of that are so pervasive, the sexual idols in our culture, the lack of truth in our culture that's being portrayed as if it is the truth. That is irksome. So that's okay. That's a good place to be. Like, we are in good company. But, and I don't want time to go here, but as we talk about this too, I mean, we have our own idols in our own hearts, which would be pretty hard to do. That's, that would hurt. We start to dig into what those look like right now. Um, but I'm going to stay on, on topic. But when you're angry at the world and the ways of the adversary, just know that that's what Paul was like too. And he did not retreat. What does he do? He sees these people and he lets his indignation for false idol worship motivate him to engage them with the gospel. He doesn't run. He doesn't say, I'm going to stay away. He says, I got to engage this. And that's how we have to prepare our children, is to engage that same thing, right? They're not going to know what Marxism is. They're not going to get taught that if we don't teach them. We don't want to run from it. We want to teach them what that looks like in the marketplace, in the Agarahs, it says. Um, and and that, that word, the marketplace in your Bible there, in verse 16 and 17 is, is way more than just a, a market. Don't think that they're just it's just fruit and stuff. That was the center of all Athenian activity, uh, life and activity. You go there every day, and he debates day by day with anyone who happened to be around. So notice that this big speech he gives at the end isn't just this one-time thing. He earned that spot by debating patiently day by day with these really smart people. He lets the irkedness, that's not a word probably, but... <laughs> Irkness, whatever. What, I don't know what you would say there. What's a plural of? That's not even a plural. That shouldn't be an engine. Um, but he lets the irkedness of the idols drive him to civil, civil conversation. Watching you guys be civil in the conversation, that's what changes hearts, right? Like, that's what, it doesn't, and I would have been the same way. I probably, that's why I'm a football coach, right? I'll get them all fired up to run through a brick wall. I don't know. I gotta work on the civil part sometimes, right? In those public spheres. But he doesn't run from it and call it evil and say, um, you know, your so-called human wisdom 
has led you to blindness, which it has, but that what it does is it reveals the heart and the care of the good shepherd. He sees a lost sheep, and he doesn't beat them down. He meets them where they're at to lovingly explain the gospel, which is our point. The Epicurean and the Stoic philosophies, they're, they're kind of different. You guys probably Stoic, right? We use that word today. The Stoics were uh, big on rational faculty of humans. They like to debate. Uh, they're very individualistic and self-sufficient. Some of you would be Stoics, big on morals even, uh, morality. Then you have the Epicureans, who Epicureans were big on, uh, they believe pleasure was the chief end of life, but not like hedonism. Not like, they've actually gone past hedonism and thought about it a little bit more. Like, you know what, there's a law of diminishing returns when you do something that really pleases you. And if it's not unchecked, it actually leads, so they, they figured this out. So their idea of, Epicurean's idea of uh, pleasure was tranquility. It was, hey, let's, let's use all that we have um, gained in our life to like, get to a tranquil place, whatever that means. Maybe it's a cabin in Colorado where um, you don't have to see people anymore. You don't have to work anymore. Like, that's their idea, right? That's the, sounds kind of fun, actually. Um, <laughs> if heaven was on this earth. Uh, but like, yeah, they were, that was their idea. And so they both had kind of differing ideas of what life was meant. They didn't think that gods were interested in their lives, but they were very similar in all philosophies on life, death, and meaning are all very similar, except for the gospel. They were both attempts to come to grips with life, uncertainty, and death, which was about what every worldview, like I said, has to explain. So I think this is probably why Paul was brought before the Areopagus, because it hadn't been something they thought about. He has a new idea. They're like, oh, actually, that's really novel. Let's talk about something new. Uh, C.S. Lewis calls that chronological snobbery, right? If it's newer, it's better. Your phone is better. You have to have the iPhone 35S, um, even though you had the last one, whatever, six months ago. That's the same idea. They just didn't have technology like we did. And they, they even call them this. They, the pejorative term they use is they say, you're a gutter sparrow, which means, that's what idle Bible means, was a gutter sparrow. They're saying, all you do is you're itinerant. You travel around the whole world. You just pick an idea from here, 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 and here, then you... You just bring it all together, and that's all you're trying to do. And so it's kind of weird. They're bringing it before people because they're a little bit mesmerized what he's saying, but at the same time, they're like, well, you couldn't be that smart because you're not from here. And you're just not itinerant. If you were that smart, wouldn't you not be traveling around, right? So they call him a gutter sparrow. But notice, and I think this is something we can apply to us as we engage the world, he doesn't let the slander make him mad. Uh, or at least if it doesn't make him mad, it was righteous, right? He doesn't turn when he gets slandered. In fact, look how he starts in verse 22. He actually endears himself to them. He says, man, I see all these idols. You guys are really religious. I am too. I'm religious. I believe in a God. He says, he doesn't lead off with, hey, you guys are evil. You're the devil. You're outside. You're going to hell, right? He doesn't lead off with that. He ignores the insults. And, and won't we get insults in this culture? We're going to get insulted. We believe in a very offensive thing. We'll talk about that in a second. But we're going to be insulted. And he sees this instead. He sees the bigger opportunity. This is an ad hominem argument against him. And he's like, I'm not going to engage in that. I've got a bigger opportunity, which is to share the gospel in the Areopagus. And so I'm not going to get sidetracked. And we shouldn't either. In our education, we can't get sidetracked with tertiary issues when the main one, which is the Great Commission, that is our commission as Christians, has to be front and center in all that we do in our education. Let's be like Paul and stay on task. Instead of figuring out who we disagree with more, right? Which that's normally where you can run into, uh, I guess, occupational hazards of how we all decide to educate our kids. But he sees the opportunity, and he gets brought before this courtroom, so to speak. The, the hill of Ares, which is Mars Hill, is right by the Acropolis. Once again, if I was a good educator, I'd put a big picture of the Acropolis up there. And you can go to Mars Hill now. I've got a piece of a rock from it. Um, it has a plaque at the whole speech he gives. One of my friends kicked the rock off and brought it home to me and I showed it to my kids, every, which is illegal. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I have it. I showed, hey guys, this rock might have heard Paul talk. Pretty sweet, right? Uh, but are we engaging, like Paul does, our students and children to engage false religions by being like he is? He's endearing. He's winsome. He's kind and he's gentle. This is how he engages them. He doesn't lead off with, I'm better than you. I know the truth and you don't. Especially 
especially when you're being slandered. I mean, of all people, the Christians should be the ones that are okay with being slandered. Look what the Peter says about our Lord in 1 Peter 2. He says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to those, to him who judges justly. And so our education of our kiddos is to also include, not only include the understanding of what is Marxism, but also in our culture, maybe even more so, how to lovingly and gently communicate those differences, right? And I want to go just a little further before I wrap up, which is soon, I promise. Because Paul, actually Luke gives us a glimpse even further into Paul. There's a, there's a depth to this passage and how he is actually just word by word touching on all of their little idols and worldviews, because there's a lot of them. And it's, it's really ingenious, which shows us how well he understood these people. And first of all, I think it's, once again, it's ingenious to find common ground right off the bat with somebody. When somebody believes something way different than you, to start off with common ground is how we're going to help influence them with the gospel, not by talking about what we different, uh, we really different. So he says, hey man, I worship with God too. And that unknown spot over there, I think I know which one that is. I don't, I don't see his name anywhere in these gods, but I can tell you who that is. Which is so kind. It's a genius. And I want to ask, are we teaching our children in our education to find common ground with the people they disagree with first? Or are we just talking about what we don't believe? How do you find a common ground? I mean, I could say Marxist because we brought it up. But how do you find a common ground with a Marxist? Or show them maybe what, what some of the things happen when you believe that, right? How do you lovingly do that? Because our kids are going to go off and see that in all specters of our society right now. That has to be part of our education. I heard a pastor say one time that Christians today seem to be known more for what they don't believe than what they do believe. And man, we believe in the greatest thing ever. Like, wouldn't it be the best to hold that up? Hey, look how awesome this is. And not just start off with what we disagree with, right? That's why people sometimes think Christians look down their nose at them. The joy and beauty and attractiveness of the one true God should be what we hold up for others to see, first and foremost. So we need to seek for ways in our education, public. Christian homeschool to educate our kids in evangelizing the lost by searching for super creative ways to engage. That's really creative what Paul just did. Hey, unknown God, I think I might know one. Right? That's creative. That way we can share the good news. And I'm not saying Paul's shying away from the truth. He, he doesn't shy away from the truth. Look at verse 31. He concludes with this. He has set a day on which he's going to judge you Judge the world in righteousness by a man, Jesus, whom he has appointed. And of this he's provided a pledge to all by raising him from the dead. So Paul still says, hey guys, your knee's going to bow. It's just, is it going to be willingly or is it going to be unwillingly? He doesn't not hold them to the truth. He still holds the truth right in front of their face. He's still bold. It's just masterful because he presents this truth with grace. He presents it with kindness and gentleness and humility. And like I said earlier, the gospel is offensive enough. The gospel is massively offensive. Hey, you know what? You're not a good person. What? You lead off with that, right? Yeah, the gospel tells you you're not a good person. In fact, your heart is deceitful above all things, so don't follow it. That's, that's offensive. So why do you got to be offensive on top of that? Let's not be. Let's not be the most offensive part about the gospel. Let's let the gospel offend, and then let's come alongside and be winsome in our witness to how we get this gospel across and show how it applies to the life. And I'm talking about tone of voice. I'm talking about body language. Every part of it has to do with how we engage people, talking over, being impatient, listening to beliefs. I think a lot of times in our education, when we focus so much on what we believe and how we're going to defend it, we don't really take time sometimes. At least I haven't. This is me talking to me. Sometimes I haven't taken time to look and understand how somebody who has a different worldview than me arrived at that worldview. Because they were probably pretty, they thought they were pretty sincere about it, right? No one just sets out to be like, I want to believe the most false thing ever. So it can destroy me. Right? No one sets out like that unless, I mean, I can say no one and speak in absolutes. But it doesn't seem like many people do that, right? So we got to be able to lovingly disagree with people and show them maybe why some of their false premises lead to really destructive things. And our students will not do that unless we show them how. We have got to be the people that lead out in that. Satan is really clever. And I know, I know for a fact I've misrepresented Satan's web of lies to kids and acted like I could reduce a worldview to a bumper sticker. And I can't. It's way more... 
It's way more um, nuanced than that sometimes. And I need to take the time to study and show my kids how to engage those things. There's not a sledgehammer argument. So once again, you saw how Paul engaged the arguments for days upon days in the Agora before he even gets a chance to speak at Mars Hill. And this is my last point. Not only did he get to do this, he knew their arguments so well because he had read their philosophers. He quotes it back to him. He read their poets, musicians, orders, culture makers. He did not sit in an echo chamber of whatever people he wanted to hear the whole time, right? Hey, those guys are going to hell. They're evil. They're crazy. They're liberal. They're whatever, right? He didn't sit in the echo chamber. He read their sources so that he could actually speak to it. I heard one time there's a liberal arts Christian school where the headmaster took his kids to the local community college, and he would take them during the science uh, section where they talked about Darwin. And what he, they, he'd match up, he became friends with the science teacher there in the, the department. And so he'd bring his kids in, and they would listen to lectures on Darwin, natural selection and all those things. And uh, at the end, they would get to debate. So he would debate with their teacher, and the kids would get to watch, which that would be pretty helpful, I think. And so one of, one of the things he said in, in this debate was he said, hey, just show of hands in here, probably a classroom about this size. He said, can you raise your hand if you have read On the Origin of Species by Darwin? And none of the kids in the community college had read it. But every one of his 25 seniors in their senior worldview class had read it. I thought, man, that's a really great idea, wouldn't it? It's a novel idea to put some people around a teacher who would lovingly and skillfully and artfully show them why what Darwin believed is contra to God making people in his own image, right? And, and then let's go from there. And I'm like, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, let's not be scared of that. Let's read what their sources are. But through our biblical worldview. Um, so we can see the underlying assumptions. Uh, and I think, I think we see this a lot in Paul's life. Uh, Paul, when he talks to the Jews, like you read, read all of the three missionary journeys, he always goes to the Jews first. And he's a little bit more direct with the Jews, right? Sometimes you would even say harsh. And then he would go to the Gentiles, and he was a little bit more meeting them where they were at because he understands their worldview and assumptions don't, aren't the same. They did not have the Holy Scripture like the Jews did. And Jesus did the same. Jesus was harshest to the Pharisees, the most conservative, to the uses, right? Because he said, you have the Scriptures and you're not doing them. And then he goes out to the Decapolis, and he goes out to the regions of the Gentiles, and he, he's a little kinder. That's probably the right word to say. He's a little bit, he's a little bit less direct, maybe, yeah. And, and, and Paul learned that from Jesus, and that's what we're seeing right here. And we need to apply that, right? We should actually probably most direct with people in our own circles who have the truth and are not doing it than with somebody who's never been introduced to this before. We're holding them to a standard sometimes that they've never even been. So, of course, they're going to think you're looking down your nose at them because they've never read the source material. So how can you get them?